from USC, Master of Professional Writing, Faculty and Student Reading Event of the fall semester. I'm Karen Tate, and this is my lovely and wonderful co-coordinator, Myrie Perrion. We would like to thank The Last Bookstore for their continued support of our program and our events, and we would like to thank Peter, and Bill and Mark and the staff for helping to organize the night. We also want to thank Corey Clark, who's going to be shooting it this evening to go on YouTube. So be sure and take a look. It'll be up on YouTube in a little while. And a few reminders, if you have anything that beeps, clicks, otherwise makes electronic funny noises, please turn it off, turn it down, put it down, or whatever now. And uh, don't forget to hang out for refreshments at the end. And it's kind of back there. You can't see it, but set up for you actually. So our uh, inspiration for this year's overall theme was Madeline's, um, for all the inner children in us, apparently. <laughs> and we incorporated that into Joan Didion's uh, Year of Magical Thinking, and came up with a Year of Madeline Thinking. Um, each month we've chosen titles and quotes from a few famous writers to have some fun with. Tonight we're featuring young adult fiction writer Madeline Langle, for November 29th, 1918. Um, we've asked our writers if they could rewrite their world famous children's fantasy, A Wrinkle in Time, how they might complete a blank in time. And what would that book be about? And Mademoiselle Langle is quoted as saying, you have to write the book that wants to be written. And if the book will be too difficult for grown-ups, then you write it for children. So we challenged our writers to also tell us about things they've written that were just too difficult for grown-ups. We are also featuring French author and existential philosopher Albert Camus, born November 7, 1913. Camus's best known works are The Stranger and The Plague. I'm sure you've all read that. The author once said, nobody realizes that some people expend tremendous energy merely to be normal. So we've convinced our writers to tell us about some of the things they do to prove to the world that they're normal. <laughs> so without further ado, we'll have our five student readers and our special faculty reader, Amy Gersler. Um, and we'll get started with our first reader, who is Channing Sargent. <laughs> Channing is in her first year with a nonfiction concentration. Um, her new title would be A Trust in Time. It would be about a family whose deep love for one another endowed them with the ability to step in and out of time, never having to face losing one another to age, illness, or death. She'd love that for her own family. We may not know that her favorite color is yellow, which is a very significant aspect of her life. Channing Sargent. <laughs> a very new work in progress. Uh, this is about half of the final work, uh, and it's, I've taken chunks and put them together to, to create seven minutes worth of material for you tonight. <laughs> it's called 1622 Vista Del Mar. 1622 Vista Del Mar reads a handwritten note attached to the bulletin board above the desk where I write. I only write notes by hand. My roommate in college would type notes, reminders, to-do lists, quotes, and then color childlike borders on them with markers before she tacked them above her desk. A typed, designed note is no longer a note, just as a painting, scanned, printed, and rolled into a tube mailer, is no longer a painting. The nature has been steamrolled out of it, and now it's just a poster. I learned two years ago that when my grandmother gave birth to her first child, my mother, she lived in a building at 1622 Vista Del Mar, right down the street from where I live now. The fact that my mother's first home was in Hollywood, just a few minutes walk from the apartment where her daughter would live over a half century later, is amazing to me. We're from Utah. We know mountains and rivers and snow. Hollywood, city of dreams, with its constant din of noise and light, its coyote-filled hills, its imported ca cars and palm trees, A-list lounge lounges and sordid motels, is not our territory. It's been so printed and reprinted, it's like a poster that you can walk around in. Yet, as it turns out, we've put roots here. My grandmother, going into labor with my mom, took the bus by herself from her apartment to the hospital on Mid Wilshire. That's putting down roots. 
Below the sprawled 1622 Vista Del Mar note is a blue leather desk organizer from which stretches a stack of medical bills. I relegated them to the back of the organizer as I'd hoped to do in my mind, but I stood them upright so that I wouldn't forget the one thing one must remember about bills, to pay them. They fan every which way, like a fern palm. Every time I look at them, I tell myself that I ought to organize them, pay those remaining to be paid, and file them away for good. But there they grow. After living in Hollywood for two years, I've grown to like the neighborhood for its contradictions and justifications. But learning of the nearness of mom's infancy, just as I'd also learned of a tumor in my neck, caused me to love it with a fierce protectiveness. Finding the actual building in which she and my grandparents lived still tucked behind that sprawling parking lot south of the sidewalk tiled with celebrity names under the unremitting lights of Hollywood and Vine was a real full circle moment. I tried to envision my grandmother living in the building at 1622 Vista Del Mar and was utterly transfixed with the notion of a young woman walking the same sidewalks as I, looking up at many of the same buildings as I, and wondering how foreign it must have all been to her, a farm girl from rural Utah. In fact, how did she ever wind up in Hollywood? It was unimaginable. I started asking my mother questions and piecing together the answer. My grandmother was born in Delta, Utah in 1922. She was the middle child of five and the oldest of the daughters. She lived on a farm, went to school in town, population 300 something, went to church, they were Mormon, and according to the Times, probably didn't have big dreams but to find a husband and have children of her own. She got pregnant at age 17 by her high school sweetheart and they got married. His name was David. Her name was Marjorie, but I knew her as Grandma Marge. The child she was pregnant with was my mother. She attended nursing school in Salt Lake City but left when David got a factory job in Los Angeles. Fresh out of high school, married and expecting, they packed up and moved to Hollywood. When I moved to Los Angeles, I felt that I was finally fulfilling an encoded calling. My mother had often spoken with, spoken with longing of Southern California. I knew she'd been born there and had lived there for several years in the 60s. I knew she'd seen walks burning. I knew she loved the beach. I knew she'd worked at the Disney Hotel 15 years before her youngest brother would find work there, establishing our Disney privilege. We all get in for free. I knew she'd pined after California ever since moving back to Utah. Five decades later, each time I would find myself driving west on the 10 freeway toward the ocean, I'd envision my mother traveling the same route with her shoulder-length blonde hair blowing in the open window of her wind yellow Volkswagen bug, hand-painted flowers lining the bumper. Los Angeles held its place in my family history like a carbon overlay, printed with romantic, folklorish words. Under the overlay, though, is the true story. David and Marjorie were both 18, mere teenagers, when they had their first child, my mother. They produced another five children, spread out over 14 years, who, neglected and abused, turned on each other, as children with violence, as adults with financial and spiritual feuds. My mother is the eldest and the only one born in Los Angeles. The rest were born in Utah after David had suddenly become frustrated with his job at the Utility Van Corporation and moved back, Marjorie following with her baby daughter a few weeks later. David took jobs and left jobs and then was drafted into the service. Marjorie was alone a lot, shuffling from friends' apartments to sisters' apartments and working jobs when she could. When David was in the service in New Caledonia, he became baptized into the Mormon church in the New Caledonia River. Newly devout, he began sending tithing money to Marjorie for her to pay to the church. Meanwhile, when she couldn't pay her rent or feed her children, she continued shuffling, moving back in with her parents in Delta or just sending her children there. It was my mother who raised her siblings, working to feed and clothe the children when her physically absent father and emotionally absent mother couldn't. In 1960, David wanted to work in carpentry, and after deciding Anaheim would be the best place to do this, moved the family back to Southern California. My mother stayed behind. She was 18 years old and a new mother herself. In 1959, she had become pregnant by her high school sweetheart and they had gotten married, a repetition of history. In January 1960, my brother was born in the LDS hospital, the same hospital where I was born 17 years later. Alone in Utah, my mother began realizing that the man who was her husband did not resemble the man she had fallen for in high school. It is easy to imagine why my mother eventually followed them to California, seeking refuge for her and her son. Just four years later, David once again moved back to Utah, taking the children who were still at home with him and divorcing Marjorie after having an affair with a woman whose home he had remodeled. 
Marjorie stayed in Anaheim, in the house down the street from Disneyland, where she would spend the rest of her life. This is a story that mostly takes place in Utah, and those moments that happen in California happen in Orange County, not Los Angeles. But we cling to the details we like and ignore the rest. My mother lived in LA in the 60s. She drove a hand-painted Volkswagen bug. My uncle works at Disneyland and we can all get in for free. We are from Utah. My mother was born in Hollywood. We choose which roots we let grow. Thank you. very much. Our next reader is Stephanie Abraham. Stephanie is in her first year in the MPW program with a nonfiction concentration. Her new title would be called A Peace in Time, stories about baking pies and gathering communities. Stephanie said she appears normal because she married an average bear and spends about 43 hours a week in a cubicle. And we may not know that she stopped dyeing her hair two years ago just as an experiment. And as a result, she's much more free. Stephanie Abraham. Thank you so much. Um, I want to read to you one of my favorite essays that I wrote. It was published in 2006 in this anthology called Nobody Passes. Rejecting the Rules of Gender and Conformity. It was edited by Matilda Bernstein Sycamore. It's called No Longer Just American. No Longer Just American. When I was growing up, my Syrian and Lebanese great-grandmothers and I were inseparable. I spent hours by their sides, mostly in their kitchens, inhaling the scents of garlic and thyme, I knew how to make hummus and stuffed grape leaves before I learned to read and write. As Arabic rolled off my great grandmother's tongues, they filled my belly with kirinai and tabbouleh, and my imagination with tales about what life was like in our homeland. I can recount their stories word for word, how they left the Middle East as young women, what immigration at Ellis Island was like, how no one should ever have to raise their kin, so far from home. Of course, the first word I spoke as a babe was habibti, Arabic for beloved. My great grandmothers instilled in me the importance of carrying on our culture and taught me to be a proud Arab American woman. I must confess, <clears throat> being the good Catholic woman that my family raised me to be, that this autobiographical snippet is made believe. Certainly some Arab Americans have experienced childhood in this way. However, this is one fourth generation mixed heritage Arab American who did not. Don't get me wrong, I didn't make it all up. The basics are true. My people did come from Syria and Lebanon, but by the time I was born, my great grandparents had passed away. My father's decision to leave Detroit, which I call the Arab American homeland, <laughs> to settle in sunny Southern California, the quickly growing Arab American homeland, meant that I only met his family once or twice as a child, and unfortunately, I have no memories of meeting his parents. I spent years wishing the imagined details in this introduction were true because I thought it would make me more authentic. In the past few years, I have met many other Arab Americans who, like me, grew up with an authentic experience of assimilation. And through hearing their stories, I have come closer to accepting my own. I grew up in the suburbs speaking English only and eating Kraft macaroni and cheese. I didn't look Arab, and most people read me as white. The only Arabic food we ever ate was pita bread. The only Arabic I ever heard was at Christmas, when my dad would talk to his sisters and hang up and say, take a tea, see emphasizing the T and easy in order to say teasy, which is a nice, a not so nice proper word for a person's behind. <laughs> Although I find it hard to believe, I don't think anyone ever said the word Arab in my house when I was young. To be sure, it was never used to refer to my brother or me. It wasn't until my early 20s that I found out that Arab and camel jockey were racial slurs. I had heard them occasionally thrown around amongst grown-ups directed toward my father, always in front of him, and always with a chuckle. 
So I understood them as fun descriptions of what seemed to be our mythical past. One day in particular, I remember standing in the kitchen and hearing someone poking at my dad about riding around the desert on camels. I remember he laughed with them. Then he explained to me what he had been told by his elders. Our Syrian family was from the Humsi tribe. As a seven-year-old, I was intrigued by the prospects of cruising around on camels through the desert, but I never thought about my Arabness apart from these occasional conversations. In 2002, I went back to Detroit with my dad to visit relatives. We, we went to a family restaurant called Ike's and indulged in a spread of Arabic dishes. As I dipped my pita bread into a bowl of kibinai, which is raw meat ground as fine as smooth peanut butter, I realized I had been eating kibinai my whole life without realizing it, but in an assimilated, passing kind of way. When I was a little girl, if my dad was hungry and wanted a quick snack, he would go to the fridge, grab a hot dog, put it in pita bread, and dig in. I didn't know anyone else who ate all the uh, raw hot dogs. When my mother fixed hot dogs, she cooked them in boiling water and served them in a bun with ketchup, which I loved. My mom thought my dad's concoction was gross. I thought it was kind of weird, but once I tried it, I was hooked. He was happy to share his indulgence with another person in the house. It was our special treat. That night at my auntie's house in Detroit, the more I thought about my relatives, the more conscious I became of how hard they must have worked to fit in and how much they had to let go of. Assimilation does not just happen overnight. It seemed as though my dad had assimilated to the point that his children passed without even realizing we were passing. Yet the traditions of his foremothers and forefathers were muted, not erased. They certainly morphed, as my pops made do with what he had. However, they continued to the extent that when he and I ate hot dogs, possibly the national food of the United States, we were reenacting the Middle Eastern feasts of his childhood. Cultures are not static. They adapt and shift in order to survive. People do, too. Not quite white. Orientalism is a specific kind of racism that targets the Middle East and Asia, the geographic region known as the Orient. Edward Said's influential work on Orientalism pointed out that the, quote, European imaginative geography, unquote, drew a line between two continents so that the West was powerful, articulate, and masculine, while the East was defeated, distant, and feminized. Through this lens, the geographic boundary of the region within Asia called the Orient is open to the interpretation of the Western imagination. It's easy to see this dynamic at work today, especially with US foreign policy where in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran are all represented as enemy nations that are conflated into one, despite the fact that all three regions have distinct cultures, languages, and histories. Since September 11, 2001, the paradoxes of Arab American identity have only become more defined. Describing the perception of Arab Americans in a post-911 world, Evelyn also Tommy asserts, quote, Arab bodies are marked with pre-assigned meetings in the United States. Suspected terrorists, presumed religious fanatic, backwards, Arabs are other, existing outside the ideological scope of belonging. Located within this racial paradox, Arab Americans are simultaneously racialized as white and non-white. Which identity to take, however, remains heavily debated. Some Arab Americans are comfortable with an identity invested in whiteness. Others, in particular many Arab American feminists, identify as women of color even though the census does not allow for this, and even when other women of color do not always acknowledge it. Of course, what determines if, if a person of color is open to debate. Other mixed heritage Arab American women I have met who look white acknowledge their privilege while at the same time asserting their ethnicity. If forced to choose, they identify as women of color. Some days I am one of them. Other days I look in the mirror and cannot deny how I look. How can I choose an identity that has substantive meaning in the world 
that acknowledges my privileges and losses and honors the internal and external complexities of who I am. Given the history of colonialism in the Middle East, it's inevitable that there will be Arabs who are light-skinned and blue-eyed, like my Sippos and myself, for example. Figuring out who I am, of course, is an ongoing process that is constantly in flux. My dad recently told his brother, I didn't know I was Arab American until I met my daughter. He explained that he always thought of himself only as American. Then he saw me speak at the Mapping Arab Diasporas Conference at the University of Michigan, Dearborn. There he felt proud to be an Arab American and realized he could no longer see himself without that identity. Even though I didn't get a chance to learn directly from my Arab grandmothers, I figured out how to embrace my Arab American heritage and how to open up the space for my dad too as well. I don't understand how I managed to be the transmitter of culture in my household. However, in this way, it seems my Sitko's legacy lives on in me. Thank you. student reader will be Howard Ho, who is in his first year with a focus on writing for stage and screen. Howard says he'd write a McFly in time about a character who constantly quotes back to the future, and what he does when his future self comes back to warn him about the dangers of quoting back to the future too much. <laughs> Howard once wrote a video game musical that grown-ups would never understand, and says we may not know that he also creates sound design and has a show playing right across the street. Howard Ho. God had feelings. In fact, he mostly consisted of feelings. Some were virtuous and others not so much. I don't feel like doing the dishes today. I want to hook up with Shirley, but she's married. I told Bob I wrote this memo, and then to cover up my lie, I rushed back to my desk to write that memo. I finished my dentist appointment, but I already started this article in the waiting area. It's the New Yorker, and there are quips worth repeating at tonight's wine tasting. No one will notice if I borrow it. You know, that kind of thing. One day, he decided that to keep others from judging him, he would change the rules. He was God, damn it. He would make himself the sole judge of what was virtuous and not. That way, if he ever felt like lying, cheating, or smoting, he would be justified. He sent out a mass email to this effect, and soon everyone treated him that way. It was the best decision God ever made. When he felt too tired to wash his Tupperware in the break room, Demi chalked it up to God's plan and reluctantly washed it for him. <laughs> Though Bob angrily called God out on the delinquent memo, Bob later apologized and conceded that God did good work, even if it was in a mysterious way. And when Steve Shirley's husband caught God and Shirley together in bed, Steve threatened divorce until God kindly reminded Steve that if anyone was going to tear their marriage asunder, it would be him. <laughs> to this day, Steve and Shirley remain joined, and as for that New Yorker article, let's just say God dazzled everyone at the wine tasting with his repartee like he was on fire. Soon everyone was talking about God, even talking to him when he wasn't there. Since he had the reputation of messing things up, or as people called it, testing them, every, everything that went wrong was seen positively as an act of God. People started praying to God to ask him not to test them anymore. God, please don't make sure we cheat on me again. God, please clean up, clean up the dirty Tupperware so I don't have to. God, please help me write those memos on time. God, please hear my prayer. Unfortunately, God didn't hear those prayers. It was hard to, since he liked to play loud music, preferably David Bowie. <laughs> he also liked to drink and get stoned, which wasn't especially good for his memory. Often he'd fall asleep drunk and high and watching I Love Lucy reruns on TV land. It wasn't very productive, but without anyone passing judgment on him, he didn't care. <laughs> With all judgments gone, Bob promoted God to VP of Administrative Affairs, a position he never thought possible due to his lack of ambition. His first day as VP arrived, and determined to make an impression, God stopped coming into work. He didn't so much as leave a note or call in sick or write an email. Assembled in the conference room, the administrative team deliberated, wondering why God had forsaken them. 
some had plausible theories. God wanted to instill in them a sense of independence and enterprise, but no one could say for sure. Instead, they decided it would be a lot more productive to pick straws and blame the person with the short one for their current situation. Demi was the first to go. She cleared her belongings and washed the last of the remaining containers God left in the sink from the previous week. Security escorted her to the administrative bullpen one last time, and she exited without hearing a single goodbye or we'll miss you. Some of her friends wanted to speak up, but they couldn't afford to risk angering God, not in this economy. Demi was truly alone in the world, her daughter having moved away with a boyfriend and her husband having found love in the arms of the second wife. Myrtle, her pet turtle, had passed away the previous summer and was buried in the backyard. Years ago, Dem Demi happily remembered coming home to her little princess, playing pretend, her husband practicing his golf swing, and Myrtle just, well, sitting there. But today, the empty house was a creaky, hollow, lonely hell. Within the hour, the ever-resourceful Demi decided to pull herself up by her bootstraps, literally, and hung herself. Bob heard the news and sent condolence letters on behalf of God to Demi's daughter and ex-husband. Bob also heard reports of chaos in the admin department. Usually, he would place the onus on the VP, but since he had just promoted him, Bob didn't want to criticize God and risk undermining his authority. Instead, he convened a staff meeting and told everyone he had faith in God and trust that whatever God was doing was part of a plan. Of course, God knew the only plan was to keep people from judging him. With his unearned bi-weekly paychecks and judgment-free life, he bought up expensive things, rubies, sapphires, pearls, diamonds, emeralds, and whimsically used them to decorate the house. He enjoyed the sight of extravagance while he was high on acid. He was now doing LSD regularly and having out-of-this-world hallucinations while listening to Space Oddity. <laughs> Agnes was relatively new to the company, having started only after God had forsaken them. She never met God, and she was tired of waiting for God to return. In fact, she doubted the existence of God. One day, she looked up God's home address in the old company directory, and after work, drove over to God's house and knocked at the gate, which, Agnes noted, was curly. No one, no one answered. She couldn't have known that God was out joyriding at 100 miles per hour in his new Maserati. That was almost three times the speed limit, but God wasn't pulled over. She waited over two hours before she went home, convinced that even if God existed, he kept irregular hours and was a spendthrift. The next day, Agnes decided she would move into God's vacant office. She grew tired of hearing conflicting accounts of God. How could he be good, perfect, and love, while simultaneously being jealous, wrathful, and a douchebag? <laughs> was it possible that God was simply unknowable and if so, couldn't she replace his inoperable mystique with her own practicality? She filled his cabinets with her own files. At first, Bob chafed, citing God's return any day now, but Agnes made it clear that despite her promotion-worthy qualifications, she wasn't looking for advancement, but just a new office to help her work even harder. And Bob had to admit Agnes was a good worker, and that empty office was an eyesore, and Agnes's use of it would at the very least lead to a more professional environment. Bob let Agnes stay on the condition she would move out the minute God returned. They had a deal. God sold everything he owned and traveled the world. He was, into, he was in Tahiti fathering illegitimate children when he suddenly felt remorse. He was strange, especially since no one had judged him in any way. Rather, it happened when he looked into the eyes of his children and realized they were as shivering and helpless as the administrative affairs department he had abandoned all those years ago. His children gave him the courage finally to figure out how he could save Bob's company. God would save them by sending his eldest bastard back to the office to bear the cross of middle management. <laughs> when the bastard arrived, the office fetted him. Predictably, Agnes, who had fancied herself better than God, didn't get along with the bastard, whose name was Chris. Things nearly came to blows when Chris stormed his old father's office and overturned all the tables, chairs, and file cabinets. Bob, rather than siding with his loyal and productive worker, reminded Agnes of their deal, saying, God has returned by proxy. Agnes moved back into the bullpen. Chris proceeded to call daily staff meetings, which were catered with thousands of fish tacos. He also invited strippers to the office. It was a nightmare for financial affairs to reimburse, and Chris ran his department like a Ponzi scheme, promising clients he would personally give them untold riches from his father's house if they would invest in him. Agnes heard of the grumblings, and befriended the shit-talking accountants. Even those who had been big fans of Chris's dad weren't exactly sure God's son was a real deal. Eventually, a group of them convinced Bob that the whole tacos and strippers approach was bad for business. 
Bob called Chris into the conference room, where a big glass wall allowed them to be visible from the bullpen. We're going to have to let you go, said Bob, handing Chris the separation documents and severance package. Chris signed the forms without saying a word. After they shook hands, they exited the conference room. Unlike Denny's quiet descent into hell, Chris packed up his belongings to a chorus of insults and sarcastic remarks. He looked, he's the son of God, let's all pray to him just like his father. Have fun in unemployment hell. And they let him have it. I mean, it doesn't come, come across on the page, but they really crucified him. <laughs> a mere three days later, Chris suffered a broken heart and died. Well, in actuality, he was undiagnosed Marfan syndrome, a rare and often misunderstood disease, but broken heart was catchier. Bob returned to work and made life a living hell for everyone. Feeling guilty for his treatment of God's chosen one, he fired those who didn't renounce their earlier sarcastic remarks. And in honor of God and Chris, who were falsely lionized as hard workers, he threatened everyone with layoffs if they didn't meet impossible quotas, and when they met them, he raised the quotas. He reinterpreted the tacos and strippers philosophy as its opposite, which meant no more females and no more inter-office dating. Any female workers caught flirting were deemed sluts and whores. To spread the message, God, Bob mandated the singing of songs about God and Chris, and he codified these new rules in a thick new office policy manual, which he demanded the staff recite from memory at regular meetings. In his one magnanimous gesture, he gave the staff presents and let them take a week off on the anniversary of Chris's birthday. <laughs> Agnes sat alone at home, as Demi once did, but she couldn't bear to off herself. She still believed God was unknowable and that Chris was a fraud exploiting the company for a false profit. This conviction is what made Agnes tick. Feeling energized, she started her own company and worked like a devil, with policies that stressed efficiency, loyalty, trust, and common sense, everything God hated. She attracted many of her former colleagues by bonding over the strange, irrational practices they were once forced to perform under Chris's teaching. Together, they had cathartic laughs about the Dark Ages. Many years later, God was in orbit, having chartered a commercial space flight. Listening to Life on Mars on his iPhone and sipping a space Mai Tai, he had finally discovered a way to completely ignore humanity. After all, caring for humans was Chris's job. Instead, God focused off in the distance on stars, galaxies, and nebulae, millions of miles away, obscured only by time and space, and he came to a realization. After a lifetime of being a derelict who thought he had the whole world in his hands, for the first time, he knew just how small he was. He wondered how he got here and what it all meant. He puzzled at the fragility of his own consciousness amidst a, va a vast universe, even less caring than himself. Feeling religious for the first time in his life, he turned off his iPhone and put the LSD back in the zip bag. Instead of disengaging, he focused on the present and enjoyed being high on the enormity of eternity stretching to infinity. And after six minutes of quiet, he said on the seventh, yeah. This is pretty good. <laughs> there you go. That's pretty funny, huh? <laughs> Our next reader is Sonia Greenfield. Sonia is in her first year and thinks she'll be focusing on poetry and essays. Sonia says she'd write a book called A Cocktail Break in Time about how mommies and daddies drink between the hours of 7 and 11 to make child rearing less agonizing. <laughs> and her opinion is either everyone is normal or no one is normal. She used to suppress the weirdness. Now she's fully on the path towards eccentricity. Sonia Greenfield. <laughs> So I'm, oh, excuse me. Okay. So I'm going to open with uh, some limericks that I wrote. I wrote them, uh, they're, they're all pregnancy limericks. I found that there was something about the indignity of pregnancy that drove me to write limericks. I'm not sure what the relationship is, but. Um, <clears throat> and some of them might be a little risque, but that's what we understand good limericks to be. Not to suggest that these are good, that's, that's for your judgment, but in any way. Um, so I'm going to open with three and close with three. There was a young woman named Sonia who feasted on cake and lasagna. Her belly got big as she sucked like a pig, but she was pregnant, so folks said, good on you. <laughs> Squ 
squeezing out my little baby's head <clears throat> fills me with a sense of dread. Will I push mainland China through the hole in my vagina? Or is he Luxembourg instead? <laughs> And uh, my son's name is Dexter, but when he was just a fetus, we called him Scooter. Um, but that name didn't stick after he was born, so. There was a little fetus named Scooter, whose in utero pick couldn't be cuter. In Vegas conceived, his parents perceived, his daddy must be a straight shooter. <laughs> And I, it seems that I've been writing a lot of um, uh, parenting poems, but they say write what you know, um, and I, I know that that's um, been a big focus of my time in my life. Um, so you may detect the theme. <clears throat> this first poem is called Festival Lights. We search the spring for carnivals and find St. Charles and Tunica Lake, so we go as if we could drive by all those neon rides making geometry in the sky. Dirt on our feet, a shattered rainbow of, excuse me, dirt on our feet, a shattered rainbow of raffle tickets confetti the ground, and kitty cars turn you in tight circles twice, punctuating your dust with delight. It could be 30 years ago, teens in crop tops, goldfish in plastic bags, ribbed beer cups in the hands of red-faced men who clearly need a drink. A hotel, a hotel band does its best with oldies as grannies toe-tapped all shook up. Missing are hot zeppelins and greasy bags and the Virgin Mary pinned with dollars. Otherwise, I could be eight again. Tight braid, mosquito bites like quarters, the flying swings spinning my heart out on a chain as fireworks become exclamation points sparking the sky with chromatic rain. And uh, we did a little uh, summer road trip uh, just this past summer and went through Yosemite and stopped in the, uh, there's a ghost town called Bodie. Some of you may be familiar with it. So this is called an oral history of Bodie. The mind of the body is optimistic. Even as the pioneer shovels dirt into the hole, the never-ceasing gust gritting her mouth and eyes, her stillborn tamped down in the hills caught with mines once ribboned in gold. Even as she thinks to lay down and die, every morning she rises and wipes the nights, swing swept in silk from the stove, puts on the kettle and goes on. In autumn, the draft blasts down the chimney and scatters sparks across the floorboards. A blackbird sings if you want to call it song, and her doctor makes another house call. But she endures beyond the mill's machinery grinding to a halt, the pastor leaving on the only coach, and winter's short supply of firewood, long enough to burn, or so he was told, the last boy born in that moribund town. Milk carton kids. Now you know they were abducted on the way to school, past chain link urban puzzles, robins scrabbling in the median, book bag hanging with the weight of history, or off the side of a rural road in late spring where slapped mosquitoes left smears of horse blood, and the churn of a distant John Deere sounded like the log song of sleep or the teens under the lantern of the supermoon by the unused railroad tracks where flowering quince unfolds pale pink among the blackberry brambles and wharf rats run the length of cool steel in search of drop chips. Or in the desert where dusk slips on her nighty and the saucers scream like gulls while the aliens shape their ecto like cacti, go green and prickly the extraterrestrials tap their feet to snap on high beams, but we call them stars. Up the kids go as your radio loses its tune. The television becomes a box of static. 
and the digital clock blinks by again and again, not stuffed in a trunk, not dragged from a lake. This is uh, the emperor. The emperor is terrible in his monster shirt, half carried, half dragged through the doors. His fit makes heads swivel while I pin serenity to my forehead as we aim for my hack. He can't uncrack my smile with his screaming. At the dining table, his lunch lavished before him, he tries to hit his servant over nothing more than a red train, then red-faced tears, kicks and squawks because the emperor was made to put it away. Carried off to his room, his feast on hold, bars on his bed, thank God, because he's an animal now, for two more roars than a dumb, thumb-sucking silence. Behold now how his excellence sleeps. Avian field guide. They can't help but make symbols of themselves. In the hall of birds, for example, we walk the glass walls of wings pinned in static flight, a bowl dripping from the mouth of the barn owl. But I'm looking at the common kind for reference. In the backyard, for example, it must have been a nuthatch nest laid to waste the morning I woke to what sounded like a crying dog. It was a blue jay marauding with a shriek. Excuse me. It was a blue jay marauding with a shriek, and she left with claws full. When all week prior, someone sat in that camellia's crown, tending. At our cabin in the woods, for example, where I carried my child through those late winter months, tracking the mating pair of geese that called the muddy pond home. In the dark, they honk their horns of distress while I birthed the boy. The smell of my own blood lingered for weeks as I counted down the goslings to zero. Again at our cabin in the woods, my newborn bawling as the sun tiptoed into the hollow. It must have been a red-bellied sapsucker that played the metal gutters every dawn, hammering my fatigue home until I begged my mate to kill it. The bird's machine gun report answered by shotgun that resonance still traveling as the crow flies. I have a, one more um, poem uh, off the subject of parenting to try and show that I have, can be diverse. <laughs> but then I'm going to finish with uh, a few more limericks to lighten the mood. Uh, this is called Alternate Realities. The celebrities are at it again. They keep stalking me for poetry. <laughs> Just the other day, George Clooney tried to deliver my pizza so I could sign his broadside. <laughs> Meryl Streep crouched in my backyard with a manuscript in hand. Julia Roberts broke into my bathroom to ask about meter. <laughs> and Charlie Sheen left 26 messages asking for sextinas, written in the colloquial language of porn. But these movie stars think they know the real me behind the poetry because they read tabloids and line at the supermarket that detail the lurid private lives of poets who take lovers, get caught without makeup, carry small dogs, enjoy gay trysts, drink absinthe, and own many chambered homes with deep pile cream carpets, secret rooms, and libraries the size of Luxembourg. <laughs> They couldn't know that I'm allergic to even numbers and no longer fluent in filthy words. I'm feeling dogged on the spring nocturnal in the city of angels with anxiety, a hundred watt moon on the rise, and the songbirds playing music well past prime time like neighbors with no children. What we sacrifice for our art, we didn't ask for this. <laughs> Does anybody know what a cervical plug is? <laughs> okay. 
Um, I'll spare you the, the details, but some of you will really understand this and some of you will say that's cool writing, okay? <laughs> a knocked up girl from Monroe sought fame, which seems apropos. Although not her plan, once her labor began, she was the star of her own bloody show. <laughs> labor stories are meant to scare, though I'm pregnant with nary a care. My water may break while I'm at, out having steak, but the chance is medium rare. <laughs> I prefer my skin smooth and bare, sleek legs with no pubic hair, but I'm shaped like a keg, I can't reach my legs, and I guess there's a beaver down there? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, our final student reader of the evening is Christina Wolfgram who is in her first semester with a nonfiction concentration. Christina would still call the book A Wrinkle in Time, but it would be about a little girl whose evil stepmother is addict addicted to Botox. <laughs> Christina is using up too much energy holding in hoop jokes to spend any time trying to seem normal. We may not know that Christina writes original songs for the YouTube channel Abby Girl covering a variety of tough subjects like walking to school in LA and most recently, the trauma of finding out that someone has eaten your leftovers. Christina Wolfram. Oh, thank you so much. And I just wanted to say a quick thank you for this because it's kind of a dream come true to be able to be reading with such talented people in a place that I really love. Um, I'm going to read a piece that was just recently published, um, and it's the first time I've ever been published, so it's really exciting. Um, thank you. Um, you can find it at marcopoloartsmag.com, and it's called Testing. I'd like to think that every girl has thought she was pregnant at one time or another. There are all these numbers looming over our heads, 99% effective, 12 condoms in each box, that one biblical situation that sends shivers up even the most virginal spine. I am no different. There have been times when an offset gurgle in my stomach makes me think that there is a tiny human growing inside me. This can be during a sex drought or a few weeks after sex. During sex, the mysterious inner workings of my, of my uterus terrify me. Maybe this is the internet's fault. I felt a strange twinge inside me last week and did the only logical thing I could think of. I googled strange boob pain. <laughs> Every website that came up was pregnant this, pregnancy that, congratulations, you totally fucked up. <laughs> Within five minutes my heart was racing and I was ready to start my next Google search. Can I still drink vodka if I'm pregnant? I figured I wouldn't like the results, so I clicked a link for an online pregnancy test, mostly because I was too nervous to pay for a stick that absorbs my pee and judges me while I pace around waiting to hear whether or not I'm going to have to accept the fact that the backwards are and babies are us is never going to turn around. <laughs> if you want to have a laugh, or in my case, a panic attack, follow this link www.thepregnancytester.com. Let me walk you through this. You type in your name. I typed in Latifa, like Queen Latifa, just in case any of my ex-boyfriends can somehow access my internet history. And the site takes you to a scanning page, which can apparently sense your hormone levels. You roll your eyes now, but when you think maybe you skipped a pill and now your boob hurts, and every Yahoo board says you are most definitely with child, this website might as well be Peter Jennings on ABC News. <laughs> Cold hard facts. Anyway, the website told me that not only am I having a baby, it is a boy, fathered by none other than Jesse Jackson. <laughs> I don't recall ever meeting, much less you know what Mr. Jackson, but at this point I was beside myself. I decided it was time for a real test with real urine. I spent Thanksgiving weekend with my aunt and uncle and their two beautiful, magnificent blonde angels 
H three and a half, and one and a half, one and a half. For the record, those halves matter in baby time. It can mean the difference between pooping yourself on a regular basis and being able to put on your own shoes. If you think for one second those two aren't related, I would be surprised that you yourself are potty trained at all. Of course, I didn't tell my family that I was having pregnancy thoughts. Then they would know that I talked to boys, and that's completely embarrassing. <laughs> Since they didn't know, I really can't blame them for saying things like, Aren't you glad you're not a parent, Christina? I can't imagine being pregnant in my 20s. And Christina, can you change this poopy diaper? If I absolutely had to explain this complete terror, I would say it's like taking five shots of tequila right before you audition for Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. You dizzily think you might drop dead at any second. Regis Philman's voice will not stop echoing in your head. And you cannot, for the life of you, remember anything you ever learned in any of those sex ed classes from high school. I walked to CVS on the worst possible day to walk to CVS, the day USC was playing Notre Dame. <laughs> Everyone around me was drunk or talking about being drunk. At every stoplight on Jefferson, we cheered. It was awful. The line of fans buying alcohol and or napkins was out the door. I didn't want everyone to see me buying a pregnancy test, and perhaps chocolate for good measure. So I slunk down the family planning aisle, muttering to myself about buying condoms for the game. You know, I guess, in case we won. <laughs> All of the tests were locked up in a glass case, so I had to get the attention of a blue polo-wearing gent and ask him to open it. Actually, what I did was tap him on the shoulder, point to the case, and make a face like I was going to bark on his khakis. He was very supportive. I have to bring this up to the register, he said. Was this all you were purchasing today? I thought about it. What would make me happy no matter what the results showed? No, I need vodka, I said with a psychotic giggle. Okay then, he said, with what I think was an encouraging smile, or a constipated smile. Hard to tell. I grabbed a bottle of vodka and some Bloody Mary mix for vitamin C, figuring if I got two blue lines, I could just drink the mix and stare at the vodka longingly as my life crashed around my earlobes. Luckily, by the time I reached the line, there were only two girls in front of me. They looked about 19 pounds and were buying vodka too. <laughs> I watched them pathetically, jealous of their teeny tiny shorts that showed off their mile high legs and designer boots. Okay, to be fair, I don't know if they were actually designer boots. I have no idea what designer boots look like. They whispered back and forth and showed each other texts on their smartphones. I checked my phone just to look busy and there was nothing. I started to sweat. I was alone. The girl at the cash register flinched when I asked for the test my buddy had dropped off for me. Maybe she thought she was pregnant, too. A smile flashed across her face when I also deposited the vodka and red stuff on the counter. When she told me to swipe my card, I think she was really telling me, good luck. I repeated this to myself over and over again as I walked home through the burgundy and gold crowds, half hoping no one would see through the plastic bag, and half hoping that a mom would see the pink box and offer to wait with me until my pee absorbed and the lines told me whether or not my imagination was playing a cruel joke on me. By the time I got home, I was dizzy all over again, Regis's voice swirling around my head like a poorly written nightmare scene in a sitcom. Who wants to be a millionaire? You're out of lifelines. Want a friend? It took all my willpower to open the box instead of opening the vodka. But I did it. I read the directions. I gagged at the directions. I peed on the stick, counted to five. I gagged at four. I called my mom while waiting for the results. She asked me about my weekend to distract me because she is one amazing mom. I gagged again. Three minutes later, there was only one line. Just like deep down beneath all my crazy, I knew there would be. My mom and I chatted for another 20 minutes. I opened my email to find an invitation to a concert. I wondered what I should wear. I felt abnormally skinny. I started writing this in my head, and I only cried for three minutes, the same amount of time it took me to realize that you are not supposed to be in my life anymore. I'm better off and free.
Um, all right, so that's it for our student readers. They all did a fantastic job. And now I, I have the honor and pleasure of introducing um, Amy Gersler. Um, Amy received a Bachelor of Arts from Pitzer College and a Master of Fine Arts from Bennington Writing Seminars, Bennington College. In the true spirit of our program, she has written poetry, nonfiction, fiction, art criticism, and done journalism. Her most recent books of poems are Dearest Creature, Ghost Girl, and Medicine, published by Penguin. If Amy could rewrite Madeline Langle's book, it would be called A Soul in Time, about the adventures of a being, re uh, the adventures of a being reincarnated as various plants, animals, objects, and people through the ages. She doesn't believe there is any such thing as a grown-up, only large and small children of varying ages. So everything she's written would be too difficult for those mythical grown-ups. Too numerous to count are the ways she tries to act, talk, dress, arrange expressions on her face to appear normal. But alas, her lifelong sadness is that she's never been successful with any of her zillions of ruses to pass. <laughs> Two important things we may not know about Amy are that she's double-jointed and she hates all melons. Let's welcome Amy Grossler. <laughs> Christina's lovely, um, heartfelt little outburst um, about um, being very happy and honored to be a part of this program and a part of this reading. Um, I'm just going to read a few poems. Um, this one is called Self-Portrait as Cave Lady. Nameless volcanoes vomit rock, can't keep cave clean. Swarms of striped flies invade at dusk, bats catch too few. Tender feeling for baby mammoth as we eat him. <laughs> Sudden juice leak from my eyes. I pet baby mammoth's roasted hide, unfold hairy ear flaps still stuck to skull and whisper into it. Later, take chips of burnt sticks, spit, plus mammoth fat, mix in cup of hand, and use paste I make to sketch young mammoth on shadow wall. Make black handprints, too. Rub mammoth fat on my old cracked feet. Rub some on scars. Gather fresh dry leaves for sleep. Give baby chunk of tusk to suck so he'll shut up. <laughs> His howls wild wolves who pace and whine just beyond the all-night fires. I think all the sort of pregnancy that's coming up in uh, tonight's reading is a, a large metaphor for the incredible fertile creativity that's <laughs> emanating in this room. Um, this is a poem called Prayer. I, I saw that um, the writer Annie Lamott has a new book that I think is about prayer, and I think it, one of the things that she says, and this is also the title, is that prayers are like usually all of these things, or one or two of them, please, thanks, wow, or something like that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I liked the, the wow so much I stole it. Um, so th this has some wows in it. Prayer. <clears throat> Thanks for the rickety body which lends us form. Wow. And for what we believe can't be scattered at sea. Thanks for itinerant monks, enraged mobs, and blind librarians. Thanks for mothers of ten sticky little leaves, salt, and dogs. Thanks for alphabets, freighted with vast past minds, for verdant oases of getting high. Thanks for a future in which silver pink fish beach themselves without ever saying why. Through your 
higher power, higher natures awaken. The guys who worked at Higher Path, the local pot store, got shot during a robbery. Sweet, long-haired dudes, both killed. Congrats on being invisible. Maybe you felt disrespected by my grumbling last night or during the infamous Prague incident from which I'm still recovering. But no, those were unhappy lapses, mere blips of primordial chaos, evil inquisitors within, adverse reactions to current events, or the medicine simply not working again. Yet you made me the crap thing I am, gave me mockery for a middle name. I talk about everybody like that when I'm mad. Don't pretend you're devastated. Today a man said to me, be nice to his penis. <laughs> a friendly enough sentiment, yet I hung my head and felt ashamed. Lord, can you rally whatever's left, chaff and dregs and sloppy grounds at the bottom of the pot? Let the Druze religion be true. May reincarnation represent the cosmos central mechanism. Lasting spirit, spare me. I require more time prior to the dread moment of impact, the inevitable, half-remembered, half-imagined shutdown. Wow. Um, so somebody is doing a, um, an anthology of poems about TV shows. And I didn't watch TV that much when I was a kid. Um, so I wrote about a show that I didn't watch because I was scared of it, um, which was The Twilight Zone. Um, so this is called The Zone. Rod Serling was a Jew born on Christmas. Recipe for alienation? Who knows? <laughs> In high school, Serling, I should say Rod Serling is the creator of the Twilight Zone in case there's any un of the uninitiated out there. Um, in high school, Serling wrote poems in the mode of Tennyson. He showed a few to his brother who laughed and crowed, give it up. The Twilight Zone began airing when I was three and quit when I was around eight. Serling introduced each episode of his show, a slim, thin-lipped, dark-haired host in natty suit and tie. One assumes the suit was black. Early TV only transmitted shades of black, white, and gray. But black and white suited him, as they say, to a T, flattered his chiseled visage, and fit the show's sincere, high-contrasted, ham-fisted morality. Serling's heavy, dark eyebrows made him look a bit primitive, an impression at odds with his voice, authoritative, grave, refined, dire, and a tad gravelly, rich with knowing tones yet riddled with worry. He looked grim, as if being lightly but painfully gnawed. I thought of Mr. Serling later when I read the myth of Prometheus in school. A brave, brooding, truth-loving guy chained to a rock by rotten gods to punish him for bringing humans fire, condemned for his efforts on our behalf to have an eagle perpetually pecking his liver. Serling had large, kind of tough-looking hands. Turns out he boxed briefly. He was by far the somberest grown-up I imagined I knew. By comparison, news anchors like Walter Cronkite seemed positively jolly, and my shy, silent father, the life of the party. Mr. Serling had whiffs of caricature about him, if I may respectfully make that observation. His distinctive hypnotic voice was often imitated. Brow permanently furrowed, he smoked, as every adult who wasn't a prig did back then. He looked perfect holding a cigarette, always something smoldering about him. My little sister and I, neither of whom are young anymore, and who family agree are of opposite temperaments, had identical reactions to the Twilight Zone. It scared us witless. Yet our searing fear of the zone took us in different directions. Opening notes of the show's theme would bring on a shuddering attack, sending me fleeing from the house 
dry, hot, dry mouth and moist. Kid sweat at that age is just weak holy water. I'd sprint out the front door as fast as my wimpy legs would carry me. My sister would plant herself on the ugly beige rug before the glowing TV. Stunned by fear, she'd be, able to, she'd be unable to move or even squeak. Every blessed afternoon, she'd seek another episode of personal torture. She'd insist on watching the whole show, her weird, kiddish addiction. Then she'd keep our household awake all night, jabbering about the devil being let out of jail, or how no one believed the nice man who saw a monster dance on the airplane wing, <laughs> or a little blonde girl who was sucked through a wall into another dimension and couldn't get home. Our parents blamed me for not preventing my sister from watching this show and thus ruining family sleep for what seemed like a decade. Oh, Tina, I am sorry for what I failed to protect you from. But I couldn't face Mr. Serling, who I realize now was a handsome man, and his two white teeth. He looked unnatural smiling, like one of those grown-ups who, if provoked, might bite even for the split second required to snap off the TV. Now allegedly adult, I'm haunted by some of the same fears that paralyzed me as a child, plus a host of, plus a host of new dreads. The Twilight Zone has dwindled to a sticky blob of nostalgia, a hard candy forgotten in some pocket, mummified by mint. Now, when a Twilight Zone marathon is broadcast, to enliven a tepid holiday, its eerie music wafting in from another room, I can pretty much keep breathing. <laughs> I even, I'm even reading a short biography of Serling, which claims that while in the military, poor Ra saw a fellow soldier decapitated by a falling crate as that unfortunate man told jokes to platoon buddies who were resting under palm trees in the Philippines. I also learned that Serling's wife, who he met in college, refused to date him at first because he had a reputation as the campus Don Juan, and that after being discharged from the army, Serling had nightmares and flashbacks for the rest of his life, as well as a bum knee. Maybe I like reading these details about Mr. Serling because they paint him as an actual human being, not the uncanny creature I once believed him to be. In college, my two best friends were an artist and a writer, both smart hippies, both male. They brought me books, dragged me to see art films and bands. Knowing them increased my wingspan exponentially. They liked to rent a stack of Twilight Zones, drop acid, and watch as many episodes as illumined their mood. <coughs> I was always too scared to join them for these Serling Fests featuring LSD. But during one, I worked up my courage and peeked into their dorm, where the battered communal TV was located. Sprawled on a brown vinyl couch from which stuffing erupted, both long hair, one clean-shaven, one bearded like Santa, they were repeating, along with Rod Serling, like it was some mantra. You are traveling through another dimension, not only of sight and sound, but of mind, and laughing their heads off. <laughs> well, I do Okay, um, just a couple more. Uh, this is something I'm working on uh, called A Sane Life something I aspire to, but usually manage to miss the boat on. A same life. Leaf skeletons everywhere, denuded wings. Faces one itches to kiss bob by every few seconds, but one must restrain oneself or risk imprisonment. They're all yakking on cell phones anyway, humming, you'll never walk alone, under their precious measured breaths. Insured to the hilt, have you any desire to be thought of in your grave? To see your visage gracing, say, the $10 bill? 
to chuck all devices and live on crackers, molasses, and the occasionally tastily prepared bug? To slosh your toxicity outside the alembic of self just to see how acidic it is? To disentangle each task's tentacles from around your scrawny neck? Relax responsibly, a beer ad urges. <laughs> and that means wall blitz on our hoppy product do no harm. <laughs> we swallow sunlight and pills, outlive our wits, and ultimately get shunted off to rest homes, tended by underpaid strangers with rich histories, prettier skins. Clean food costs more than the poison kind. Soft, tasteful clothes in natural dyed hues, paprika, cinnabar, almond, cost more than the loud, overstarched ones. Sail on prefab yurts. My opponent's attitude towards planet Earth seems to simply be good riddance. Come to think of it, dispensing random, impulse-driven kisses might be just the ticket worth a day or two on the clink. A friend with inside info says every cell downtown's got color TV. <laughs> he claims our local jailers make great pizza. <laughs> that, that is a, I'm just gonna read one more really short poem. That is a true thing. My husband had a friend who got locked up for stealing cars when he was drunk a long time ago, and we went to visit him in this little tiny jail up the coast, and he said, oh, it's great in here, man, that you have such good pizza. <laughs> um, this is a cheerful little ditty called Dear Nation of My Dead. It's one of those ones where the first line runs into the body of the poem. Dear nation of my dead, atheist Jews, seizure sufferers, genius drunks, little brothers, warblers of orias, arias, cross-dressing shrinks, old loves with viral appetites, daughters and sons who never saw daylight, hamsters and scrappy cats of my youth. Yeah, I'm mad crushed, sniveling, conscripted by myth, your smug, triumphant. Nature dutifully scatters your essences, dramatic, illegible. So what's a sentient being to do marooned on this bar stool, but slurp, savor, summon, and pray, as I sop up this gravy with hunks of warm sourdough torn from this morning's glowing loaf. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Amy. And uh, thanks once again to everybody who read tonight. You all did a fantastic job. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our reading for the evening, and as a matter of fact, our reading series for this semester. And that was our brilliant faculty member, one of them, but we have others here. So faculty members, please stand up, wave your hand, and let us see where you are. There we are. Thank you. Um, we want to thank Peter Woods, who put everything together for us and helped coordinate, and Billy Mark, who set things up here from the last bookstore, and also the staff. We hope they'll have us back again. And we also want to thank our camera person, the lovely Corey Clark. He will be, um, or th this will be put on YouTube, so be sure and watch and tell your friends to go and watch as well. Now, this evening is not only the conclusion of the reading series for the semester, it is also the end of <laughs> Nairi Noel Perrion's <laughs> reign as coordinator. This will be her last night because she's going to graduate. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, now that I've had some experience helping to coordinate these evenings, I want to make sure that everybody knows doing it alone is no 
joke. <laughs> it is like throwing a raid every month where you hope people will find the location and that the interesting talent you book actually does show up. So it's work. So we want to thank Nari again. Thank you. Well, I just wanted to say um, it's been such a pleasure putting these on for almost two years now. And um, I love seeing everyone's support and what everyone comes up with throughout the year. And it's such a great way to just demonstrate your work and test it out in front of an audience and have fun. So thank you for letting me host the reading series. And I'm really excited to pass it on to Karen. So. So everybody, refreshments are right back there in the corner, and I'm not taking anything home, so <laughs> eat it up. Thank you.